Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I want to take you to September 13th, 1862 in Charleston, Virginia, today West Virginia, where 10,000 troops, 5,000 Union, 5,000 Confederates fought a battle that is little remembered today. It was part of a campaign called the Kanawha Valley Campaign. The Confederate commander was William W. Loring, the Union commander, Joseph Andrew Jackson Lightburn. There wasn't much infantry fighting. It was a small number of casualties. There were some casualties caused by artillery fire. There was a lot of that. At the end of the day, the Confederate forces won, and that went down in history as a Confederate victory. And not long after that, the successful conclusion of the Kanawha Valley Campaign that drove Union forces temporarily from the region. Now, one of the parts of the battle and the campaign that are not talked about is the retreat by Union forces, including Ohio soldiers, from the battlefield. There was an account written by a man who only used a pen name, 44th, which had to be related to the 44th Infantry, which was part of the fight. To this day, we don't know his name, but the vivid account he wrote of the retreat, the horrors of that retreat through hostile enemy country in Western Virginia, still a year away from statehood in the United States, that horrible retreat, the men making their way through enemy hostile country and accompanied, joined by citizens and African Americans who were seeking a way out. This account appeared in a newspaper in Ohio, the Troy Times, about two weeks after the battle. I want to read the passage, the end of the long, rather long letter that describes the battle and its aftermath. The end is particularly poignant. For those of you who are students that are new to the Civil War, you're going to hear a term here called contraband. That particular word was commonly used in the North during the Civil War to describe a status for enslaved people who had escaped to the United States or somehow come into uh, the Union fold, if you will, inside Confederate territory but had yet to be declared citizens or some other legal designation. Later in the war, you begin to hear the term freedmen, which reflects the changing status and the laws of the federal government and changes in the culture. So listen for that word and listen for all of the descriptive language here, the vivid language. Again, this is by an individual who only signs his name as 44th. Before we begin, one further note. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Military Images contributing editor Phil Spoggy. He's the one who found this account in newspapers.com and shared it with me. Phil is a great researcher, very knowledgeable about weapons, and he's an important part of the staff of the magazine. So I'm grateful to him for sharing this account. And now I want to read it to you. Again, we start at the end and we... We're, we're, we're getting to the moment in time where the soldier is trying to catch up with his regiment. So here we go. By some means I have never been able to account for, I missed my regiment, believing it to be in advance of me. I left an ambulance where I had been attending a man from the 4th, that's the 4th Virginia Infantry, later to become the 4th West Virginia Infantry, who had suddenly been taken sick and hurried on. I soon came up with the train, and it was all train. I traveled all night, making 20 miles, only to learn that the 44th was far in the rear, protecting the retreat. In modern language, the rear guard. I have never seen it since, but all the way to Ravenswood, straggling detachments 
had been drifting past us and still they came. I wish I had the time, the power, and the ability to convey to you some idea of the horrors of our long retreat through a hostile country, the scorching September sun pouring down upon the dusty roads, the scarcity of food and water, and the anxiety which we all shared and which was urging us on while exhausting nature called loudly for food and rest. The enemy, confident in numbers and enraged by their discomfiture, followed us like hungry wolves, so closely at times that we could hear the hellish pack yelling as our straggling columns came in view in passing over a hill or some exposed position of the road. Nor were the soldiers the only sufferers, hundreds of ref refugees, citizens with their wives and little ones, pressed along the crowded highway, and a perfect army of Negroes buoyed up with the hope that their dream of liberty was to be realized at the end of that dreadful march. Gray-headed men and women tottered, fainting and hungry, after the groaning trains and little children waited, wailed piteously to be taken home. Women stood by the roadside, wringing their hands and weeping in helpless misery as they saw us pass. But among all the terrible incidents of the march, none were more affecting me than the fate of poor Caroline, a colored woman from Malden. She was a free woman, but born and brought up a slave in one of the wealthiest families in Virginia. A favorite with her mistress, she had been raised almost as tenderly as an own child, and, when of age, was freed. Her husband was a slave, but escaped into the winter and went to Canada. He is a white man to all appearances. His master had threatened Caroline with being sold to pay for her husband should she ever fall into his power. And when she heard that we were retreating, she was so terribly frightened that after hurrying off her children, she got out of a sickbed and followed the army. She got leave to ride in the wagon when we left Charlestown, but the next day, some inhuman fellow put her out in the road. I saw her begging to be taken in and making faint efforts to walk. That night, she lay down by the roadside and died. We reached the Ohio at Ravenswood Monday night and waded across it next morning into Ohio and were everywhere met with a generous welcome. Loads of provisions were awaiting us at almost every home, and many a rough fellow that had been born, all the fatigues of the march without a murmur shed tears of gratitude. Everybody had a God bless you for us and all seemed to think it an honor to shake hands with us. When we entered Pomeroy with the man who had lost his leg, it's talking about one of the wounded soldiers that was in an ambulance, the street was crowded with women who offered, made offerings. The kind creatures strove with each other who should take us home. Food and consolation awaited us everywhere. Oh, I could not have been anything else but a soldier than for the world. While I write, sitting in the dust by the road, the train is still pausing, and a stream of refugees and contrabands is pouring all the way to Gallipolis. Signed, 44th. So there you have it. The account of the passage of Union troops loyal citizens of the United States in Western Virginia and contrabands, that is African-Americans, black people who are enslaved, looking for a way out. Powerful eyewitness account by a man we only know by the pen name 44th. So thanks for listening. Thanks to Phil Spoggy, our contributing editor at Military Images. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.